Um, I'm Selwyn Bleeden. I'm head of Africa coverage for, uh, the, for commercial property finance for the Barclays Africa Group. And uh, we've got quite an illustrious uh, panel with us. And um, I'm going to start in the order that they're given. Uh, Louis Depi, representing Actus. Um, Akim Ogoniran uh, uh, from UPDC. Michael Awari, who is a colleague from the Barclays Group and is head of debt uh, for, uh, for East Africa. And Stuart Chayat, who is um, the founder of Land Equity Investments. I'm going to give a, a brief introduction. Um, it's not necessarily going to be a strict guide to what we're going to discuss, um, but I will also mention the questions that um, were originally agreed with the, with the conference organizers. So the, uh, the, the topic is beyond pioneering. And uh, these, these are the questions that, that, that we originally raised. Uh, what is determining the evolution of corporate and funding structures? And I think that that question assumes that there is an evolution of corporate and funding structures, and that's an open question. Um, how have existing funding structures performed? And we have representatives of uh, established market players, so I'm going to pose that question to them. How are investors responding to those structures? And then how are financial institutions responding to reforms and related developments? So uh, I think this discussion follows on from an earlier panel discussion in the same room uh, where there, there were representatives of senior debt, mezzanine debt, equity investment, and so on. Um, but I think the, the, the theme that we should be pushing is that next step beyond the pioneers and how that works. Let me just give a little bit of background uh, for us to keep in mind, there's um, an existing pattern to investment and financing. There are existing investment and financing models, and we can discuss those and challenge those. Um, there's a corporate model, an investee model, the, the, who is taking in money, how, how are our investments and, um, and, and clients, in the case of banks, how, how are they structured? And how, do, how, does, how does this change and evolve over time? Pretty, a pretty picture for you, or may not, maybe not such a pretty picture. So uh, we've commissioned some research to try and understand how investment flows work, whether there are investment hubs being created. Certainly on an international basis, there are investment hubs. Um, this, um, this illustrates the top thousand uh, foreign direct investment transactions since 2013. And it shows um, the source cities to destination cities. And our focus is really on cities uh, rather than specific countries. But you'll notice that um, there's a dramatic split between the north and the south. So Africa is still quite a vacant continent um, in this picture. And there's a lot of uh, flow to and from uh, northern hemisphere cities. Interestingly, there's some of the regional comments that we made earlier, for instance, by, by Martin, Martin Davis, uh, there, there is some East to East Africa flow that you will pick up in this picture. This is general foreign direct investment. It's not real estate specific. We will, we will look at our real estate specific, the real estate specific picture in a, in a moment. So this is the Africa specific picture. And I suppose the, the point I made previously about some of the regional flows is uh, more enhanced here. So we have a lot of European investment into North Africa, and uh, we have Asian investment into East Africa. Now, uh, one of the interesting things to notice is one of the biggest source cities for um, FDI into Africa is Johannesburg at, at number four. And that is the only city which is really an Africa to Africa investor that ranks in the top 10. So that's just something to, something to notice. And then something else to notice is on destination cities, uh, there are very few of them that are um, sub-Saharan cities. And uh, uh, it's, difficult, it's difficult to read. Uh, Johannesburg is at number two, Lagos at number five, I think, and Cape Town at number seven and uh, I think uh, Dakar at number 10. 
So the others are North African cities and they fall into more the, um, the, the kind of Arab world and, and there are flows in that direction that you'll see. So it's just something, so, so I think this sets up, a, 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 there, there are two ways to see this and it's probably better shown here. If you look at total real estate, so now we're focusing on real estate, foreign direct investment into various cities, again, Africa is kind of left behind. Um, and the, and the, the point made previously for general FDI is even clearer here. In terms of property destinations, you've got Lagos and Johannesburg at eight and nine. All the others are North African cities. So you can see this negatively that we are an investment backwater to some extent, and we are still at a pioneering phase. Or positively, that we're at a pioneering phase and that gives us a platform to build our own models, to create our own kind of investment strategies and funding strategies. And so I'm hoping that uh, the, uh, the panelists will uh, help enlighten us. I'm gonna give each one of them um, let's say 30 seconds to a minute to introduce themselves and kind of ex express a starting view on the notion of pioneering and going beyond pioneering. Um, Hakim, are, are, are you willing to start? <laughs> uh, you're the boss. Um, thank you, everybody. Um, my name is Hakim Ogunor. I'm the managing director of USCN Property Development Company, PLC. We are real estate developers. We are a member of um, a large conglomerate in Nigeria known as the USA Group. Um, there are 10 companies in the group, um, six of which are listed, including our company. And we're just basically the real estate arm. We are more in, into residential developments, but recently we've um, made some inroad also into office, retail, and um, industrial developments um, as well. Thank you. My name is Louis Depper. Um, I've been told I've got a booming voice. But um, essentially, um, I represent Actus. I'm a partner within Actus Real Estate. Um, Actus, as a, as a private equity firm, has managed or to raise around $13 billion of capital for deployment in emerging markets. Asia, um, Africa in particular, has been a, a good destination. And uh, we have three pillars to the business. One is renewable energy, so it takes a, a large portion of things like wind farms, solar farms, etc. And uh, we have a second uh, leg to the, the strategy, which is general private equity, and that invests in, in all the markets as well. And the one that I'm more involved in is the real estate arm, which is uh, a slightly smaller fund. We've developed assets of around $1.4 billion. We've raised just short of a billion dollars worth of equity to deploy on the African continent since 2006, and essentially have been operating in somewhere between eight to nine countries across the African continent. Our focus is sub-Saharan Africa. We don't do anything outside sub-Saharan Africa at the moment, and uh, yeah, it's been quite a successful hunting ground for us in the past, and uh, look forward to success in the future. Thanks. I'm Stuart Chait. I'm chairman of Land Equity Group, which is a South African-based uh, developer, mainly mixed-use, large mixed-use developments. In Cape Town, we are developing uh, vertical buildings, mixed-use vertical buildings, with the highest one being 0 to 1 tower. In Johannesburg, in the past, we developed, we were a developer of Melrose Arch, and we are currently in the final throes of raising equity to develop the, the largest mixed-use development on the African continent in Midrand, which is 2 million square meters of mixed-use rights. Um, in Africa, uh, our company is called Africa Real Estate Investments, um, and I backed a team, and essentially what we do there is just simple uh, neighborhood retail centers, um, simple, simple in terms of South African terms, not so simple when you get onto foreign soil. Um, but interesting today to talk about the financing of these things because it's been a, a learning curve and I think we've eventually got it right. Over to you. Thanks, maybe I'll use this one. Hi, um, I'm Michael Awori. I'm with Barclays and I manage our long-term debt business uh, in East Africa. Uh, I'm based in Kenya. 
Um, majority of my business is supporting my clients in the in the corporate space. So my bread and butter is is corporate debt, uh, is debt facilities to corporates um, and sovereigns across across East Africa. Uh, Kenya is our our biggest market, so that's takes up most of uh, my time. Um, I'm probably the, the least qualified to be on this panel, um, to be honest with you, because I, I uh, moonlight, if you will, in, in the real estate world. Um, but that's, I think, a function of the support I do for my clients, which I think is also a function of how real estate has evolved, uh, certainly in Kenya and, and in East Africa, being an extension of uh, family businesses and sort of a, sort of a wealth preservation uh, wealth preservation um, strategy. I'm going to ask a, a couple of questions uh, before opening up to, to the floor and just uh, to allow the panelists to express their views on, on some of the questions. So, so uh, and, and also just to respond to some thoughts that, that, that I have. And as I said when I introduced the first question, which is what's determining evolution of corporate and funding structures, I, I'd, I'd love to know from the panelists, whether they've seen that evolution. If I could start with, with Michael, um, you said that you moonlight on the, on the, on the uh, property finance side. Your normal corporate lending, you know, to what extent could we do something different on property finance and to what extent have you seen an evolution in the, what your clients want and how your clients are structured? Thanks, Owen. Um, so, so as mentioned, I think it's, it's probably worth looking and, and ensuring sort of we understand the evolution, again, of the sort of corporate sector, again, certainly in Kenya and East Africa. Um, outside of the parastatals, um, most of the economy in East Africa is driven by family-owned businesses. Um, and, and these businesses have, have over time, um, again, viewed property as a family wealth preservation strategy. And so it's not uncommon to have a large, uh, could be manufacturing business, FMCG business, um, that uh, on the side will dabble in real estate with, let's say, a housing development, and then, and then over time expand that into a commercial development. And, and indeed, I have some clients now that have very sizable uh, real estate portfolios um, but which are not the main business. The main business is is the um, is the corporate underlying corporate business, and so those those companies, in terms of the funding for um, for the real estate, I think the other factor that um, is driving the funding, and certainly in the Kenyan market, is you know there's the old adage: um, if you build it, uh, they will come. I think when it comes to financing, certainly in Kenya, it, it would be if you build it then you will be able to lease it. Um, the concept of pre-lets is, is really sort of unheard of, um, you know, for the most part in Kenya and East Africa. Um, but again, that sort of fits the illusion of the business because these family businesses have a corporate balance sheet that they could rely on, and so the financiers can look to that cash flow to support uh, the property business. Um, that said, over time, as, as those businesses have grown, as, as the market has become more sophisticated, um, there has been more growth of standalone, purely property developers, both indigenous Kenyan or African companies and companies from, from outside the region. If you could pass the mic to, to Akim, I, I'd like to ask, ask him. He represents a, a really s traditional an established player in, in Nigeria. And I, I think if, from the point of view of a company that has been a pioneer in its sector, how do you see yourself evolving and what would you want from financiers? Okay, um, I think just to start from where you um, started from, it depends on how far you want to go in terms of the evolution. You know, if you really want to go far back, um, just as Michael said, um, traditional real estate was financed by individual savings in Africa, individual savings and, um, and equity. Um, that evolved into cooperatives uh, in most parts of Africa. Um, for us, um, we started many, many years ago, well over 50 years now. We are listed and we've seen a, a significant shift from what we used to do in the past. I mean, so um, as the markets have become sophisticated, we've also had to up our game 
Um, so in the past six years, for example, um, I've issued corporate bond. I issued a corporate bond in 2011, a 30 billion era corporate bond. We floated a rate in 2012. Um, I just got out of the market again now, um, doing a right CU, and I'm in the process of floating also another corporate bond uh, as we speak. You know, so over the years, it's become important for us as players because I, I always stress the fact that, that real estate is at the end of the day a financing game. We have to look beyond the brick and mortar. We have to look beyond the project planning and all those things. Eventually, if you're unable to match your assets and liabilities in an optimal manner, you are dead. So you need to pay particular attention to your funding model that enables you to continue to grow and develop your business in a sustainable way. So what we have done over the years, um, within the possibilities in the market, um, tough legal environment, tough macroeconomic conditions, you know, we've tried to position our business such that we're able to take advantage of uh, by creating new asset classes and basically say that so we've done equity, we've done debt, we've done uh, corporate bond, we've done, we've floated the REIT, you know, and we've been at the vanguard of um, promoting reforms, you know, which has also helped um, um, the market. Typical example um, on REITs in Nigeria, uh, major breakthrough recently, um, now if you look at um, now, the government came out with new guidelines on pioneer status for tax exemptions, you know, and there are two significant items on that list. Uh, number one is REITs or, or, or vehicles on that REITs and also asset-backed securities, you know. So that has helped in a way to solve the tax issue which we've grappled with for the past five, six years. You know, so as a player, we've had to continually monitor the market, look at what happens and then take and create uh, your funding model in a manner that you're able to take advantage of all those, of all those opportunities. Thank you. Uh, to Louis, so you, you represent a different traditional stream, uh, the private equity stream, and uh, many of the pioneers in the African markets have been structured as private equity houses. Um, UPDC has, as, as Akim has explained, has evolved in its corporate structure and its financing approach. How are you evolving? Um, okay, so going back to the kind of uh, origination or the, the understanding of how PE firms are structured, most of them, um, they are generally typically closed-end funds, so they have a limited lifespan. They have various segments within there, one being a, a, an investment window in which you, you need to commit and allocate your funds that you will commit and spend. You'll have an execution period, and then you'll have a harvesting period that you would look to, to exit out of the assets. So effectively, that closed-end fund makes it, uh, how can I say, it's very book-ended. So in other words, you have a start date and you have an end date, and you have to operate from everything from starting the asset, building it out, um, nurturing it over the line to get it stable, and then look to sell it. And I think what we've certainly found over the three funds that we've raised is that you know, our structure and the way we approach things is not always ideal for a private equity model. I think if you had to turn to something like an evergreen fund where equity was raised and then continued with no end date, I think you would certainly have, have the upper hand and I think that's probably where things are going. It is a very challenging one. Investors don't like it because it doesn't return capital back to investors at any predetermined basis. So that becomes you know, difficult to raise capital. So you've got to look to your investors to see what you can raise and then you have to look to the markets to see what you can actually deliver and you, you, you play in that kind of space. So given the, the limitations that we've got in terms of our funding that we raised, our investment criteria, et cetera, we have, in the first fund, we actually started um, doing a lot of direct investment where we, we sat down, we ran through construction contracts, we engaged architects, we engaged project managers, we even had project managers on, on the team. And it's a very, very slow process. And it took us a long time to get those first assets out of the ground. And it was a very small fund. It was $155 million of equity. And I think we used to go around and just talking, touching on the debt side of it, a lot of that debt was coming from you know, DFI supporting commercial banks because the debt markets weren't very deep. Um, fast forward to the second fund and the, the, the pace of investment and deployment of capital that is required from the, the size and scale of the fund means that you actually start leveraging your position more. You start looking to, to set up more development partners and we moved away from being, how can I say, a, a kind of hands-on mixing the concrete ourselves to one where we were backing teams and trying to set up teams to deploy the capital to execute faster. And fast forward to the third fund, there is a far greater focus on our side to, to be more of the investors backing teams and in backing development partners 
rather than us actually picking up and trying to execute. Because to deploy a, a third fund of $500 million, there are definitely the opportunities. And you know, to, to manage that with a team of somewhere around 13 people, 13 to 15 people, it's a very small, small team. So you need to leverage on that ability to deploy capital as fast as you can, to put it into the market, and then to, to look to nurture it over line. I think there will be the, the next evolution will be around the exit strategies on how people exit their assets because there has been a change in the structure um, in the heydays when, when the markets where everyone was looking north to the, the Africa rising uh, narrative, you had a, a, a large influx of yield funds that were looking to, to take off those assets and therefore return the capital that we needed. What we are finding is that this is a, a you know, no one solution is going to, to fix this. So you're going to need private equity players, you're going to need debt providers. I was in one of the earlier sessions and there was a talk about moving with mezzanine finance and securitization. And I think all of it will come to bear in our markets in different stages and different forms and different sizes. And I think there's a role for every, every asset class and for every single debt product to be in the market as well as, as, as well as equity. So you know, it is something that is going to evolve even further. So you are going to have the securitization. But if you look at the, the history of property um, in the South African context, you saw a large portion of pension fund in investment. You had Liberty Life, you had Old Mutual that took very big stakes with patient capital with a very, very long-term view on setting up these really supersized regional assets. Um, and that we don't see on the continent to the same extent. You've got impatient capital, you've got investors in private equity funds that are very focused, they are commercially driven, they're all looking for their returns to their investors and the people that have put money with them. Um, and they want that return. And they are not going to wait around 50 years for us to develop out an asset, say it in the market, it's bad, can't do it now. So they, they are very focused in getting that return. So whatever we do is, is return focused and it's about returning the capital to the investors at the end of the day. So turning to, to you, Stuart, the, uh, you, you know, your, your organization has a little bit of leeway because you're, you, you, you've been able to start yeah. later, but okay. your response? So to answer the question, what's determining the evolution of corporate and funding structures? To me, very simple. The answer is the appetite for risk and yield. Okay? And based on that, I mean, when we went out to the market, it, it's very simple. When you go and explore Africa, you can see the opportunities. It doesn't take, you've got 1.1 billion people, uh, you've got average age of 22 years, so you've got a young population, it's going to explode with the, and it's got nothing to do with resources. It's got to do with the introduction of consumer credit throughout the market. It's starting to happen through cell phone banking, etc. So people are going to want cars, they're going to want credit cards, they're going to want houses, and so on and so on. It's not being driven by infrastructure, and it's certainly not being driven by, to in, if you look deeply, it's not being driven by the resources. It's give a person, it, the entrepreneurs out there, Give them consumer credit, businesses will be formed, and, uh, and, and it will explode. And it is the last continent to, to kind of be developed. So when we went out looking for these opportunities, we said we want to be in, if we're going to cross the border, South Africa's border, we want to be in seven of the ten fastest growing countries or economies in the world, which were in Africa. How are we going to do it? We set out a strategic master plan which took us four and a half years to do. Uh, we, we examined the market, we examined which tenants wanted to be where, where the, where the kind of um, buying power was and, and uh, who had been there before, where our competitors were, and specifically the retailers were telling us where they wanted to be, so we just followed the retail demand. And essentially what we've done is we've mapped out seven countries, 23 cities, 300 retail centers. And they're not big, they're eight to 10,000 square meters. Uh, what we've done is we've, we've kind of value engineered these things down to the bone where we can build them for $25 million and flip them for about 40. So there's no, there's no other place in the world where you can make those kind of margins. Um, it is difficult. How are we gonna do it? Because uh, things in Africa, or Africa time is different to the rest of the world. Things happen very slowly, but if you, if you kind of latch on to a, to a local partner who has a track record of delivery, which we've done, and uh, they have delivered for us, and you latch on to many local partners, you're able to deliver quickly, and you've obviously got to delegate and have strong teams, strong teams of people with track record, and that's really what we look to. We look to back the people. 
And, uh, Michael, turning to you, the, uh, uh, you've heard what the producers of, of assets say, and uh, so from the point of view of finan from a financier's point of view, what are you looking for in evolution? Right. I, I think it's been it's been heartening to see again the evolution from um, structures just being reliant on again the corporates, right? Reliant on uh, the corporate business and the corporate cash flow to support um, to support the property investment. Um, to to the point being where again you have some of these family businesses that now the property business can actually rival the size of the original corporate business. Um, and these, again, these families are evolving to the point where they're deciding uh, to actually to move into property full time and make it, you know, a uh, structure that's more professionally run as opposed to just something that's done on the side. Um, I think that's been really heartening to see. And again, I think it's, it's been heartening to see the development in terms of the portfolio being more professional about the structures, having external players also come into the market, um, but also again, the, the evolution of some of the indigenous players as well, who have been in the market um, from for, for a long time to do more, doing more uh, uh, developments and actually getting some recognition outside uh, of the local market for the structures that they've been able to introduce. Um, to the point where now, you know, we talked a little bit earlier about, you know, the prelats and how uh, for the for the longest time, that was something that was just unheard of. But in some of the large developments now, um, you actually see being able to sign up, <laughs> <Actually> um, tenant, <laughs> <laughs> be able to sign up, you know, a, an anchor tenant with a sizable name. And um, actually, in some of the you know large retail um, developments, you know, particularly in Kenya, um, you have again been able to see two or three large large uh, tenants signed prelets. So. All of that has been really encouraging to see that you know, the sector is developing and then the funding structures will, will develop alongside that as well. So I'd, I'd, I'd now like to open the floor. I think there are quite a few in, interesting themes that have come out. It's what's driving evolution, consumer credit, and there may be other theories that people want to put forward as well as how it's affecting uh, debt funding uh, for, for Michael. Then in, in the case of Akeem, the uh, Nigerian evolution, a corporate that uh, adopts different finance, financing structures, launches REITs, corporate bonds, and so on, to sticking with private equity, but acknowledging the, uh, the, the strictures and the challenges that has. So, um, yeah, it, uh, handing over to everybody else in the room, any, any particular questions, responses, comments? There are quite a lot of people here. There should be somebody who's got something to say. It's all here, go. <laughs> go, on, go. Uh, Thanks, Owen. Oh. Well, yeah. Uh, Patrick Katawa from Cushman and Wakefield. Um, I think something that we have uh, observed of late, especially on the office sector, is that your multinational corporations are all signing, you know, one to three year leases max. I think seven years ago they would sign five, seven year leases. Um, so, you know, when we place them in existing buildings, we don't have an issue because uh, the building is already up. But how do you then position yourselves as financiers for greenfield developments where you've got a corporate that's coming in, but they're only signing one or two years? That's on the office side, and similarly for mega DCs and warehouses as well. Uh, it's very common now for them to sign not more than two years. So how do you reinvent or reposition yourselves to create solutions around that? <laughs> um, I think it is quite interesting. I think it's to Stuart's point to some extent. It's where do you play on the risk curve and what yield are you prepared to take? Um, if you look at private equity, you're generally further up the risk curve than a, a bank that is being more traditional. Um, so I think, yes, there is an appetite. I think um, if you take an example, we've just closed a transaction which is uh, an expansion of a South African business into the rest of the continent. It's an industrial uh, player, and the intention there is to, to leverage the position of the skill set that is in South Africa abroad. 
Does that mean that we would be looking for shorter duration leases in Africa just because of the risk profile, because the, co uh, the corporates are, are seeking that? The answer is probably not. We'd still look to those blue chip covenants because ultimately the strength and the resilience of that asset is still around the, the covenant strength of the, of the tenant. So it, it again, I think we've had discussions with some of the big uh, 3PL logistics companies. They kind of were, were touting timeframes in South Africa around 15 years. In some of the markets, they, in Zambia or Nigeria, they're sort of saying, well, they wanted to reduce that to, th to five years. Essentially, once we've deployed the capital, we are pretty sure that the quality of the assets that we deliver will speak for themselves. They'll actually be able to retain those tenants based on the quality of the build that you get in. I think a lot of the international corporates are looking at the quality of the build that's currently on the ground and saying, hell, I don't want to be in here for the next three years, so I need to have an exit clause. And I think that's the difference. So coming up with quality product and building to suit their needs, they would be more than happy to be there for a longer period of time. It is no fun moving. You, you know that it's no fun moving tenants every three years to a new location and a new location. So, and they don't like it, it's, it's, it sets their home. They like to have the delivery addresses and everything sorted out and the logistics. So, you know, people will stay in their addresses as long as the buildings that, are ca that they designed or work for them, work for them. Any, anybody else wants to comment? Yeah. Not? I, 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 yeah. Okay, okay I, I think my, my additional comment to that is that, I mean, I, I do agree with that point. And I think that ultimately, um, the markets have changed. Um, before in Nigeria, for example, we used to have um, tenants who paid five years rent in advance, um, had done a deal in the past where we developed two major buildings and I had two tenants. One paid me five years rent in advance, the other one paid me three years rent in advance, you know, and we were all just smiling all over the place. You know, but those times are gone. Uh, we've, followed, we've also seen, for example, that in the retail, in the retail um, sector, um, now the evolution is so is such that you know you are even compelled to to, to take um, th quarterly rents, which was never heard of in Nigeria, and things like that. But I think ultimately, um, once the quality of your asset is good, um, tenants are looking for value. That's my view. And, and we had an experience, for example, when we were floating our rate, um, I had a rating agency from South Africa who was looking at one of our buildings. And they were worried that um, um, we signed basically yearly, yearly leases and that was going to be a major issue. You know, but this was a building that has been there for like 20, 22 years. You know, and uh, some of the tenants there, they've been there for 16, 17, 18 years. So even though they sign yearly, um, yearly tenancies, you know, they, they're going to be there provided you maintain the level of service and, 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 and things like that, you know. So I think that with the current state of the market, it's going to be very difficult, um, which, which is a challenge because then you, you, you have to draw a clear balance be, between um, your capital. Um, capital is very impatient, you know, but you must choose those tenants care carefully um, and make sure that once they, they enter your building, you do all that you need to do to keep them there by providing the level of service which will keep them there for, for the long run. I think that, that's the solution, the way I see it. Uh, can, can we go to a, another question? There was, there was a question over there. Sure. Um, Zoe from G5 Properties. I guess this is a question for Michael, really. Are banks open to reducing their pre-lets or pre-sales percentages? Because what we found as developers is it's very difficult to uh, secure tenants and start building, uh, uh, meeting those pre-lets or pre-sales. But as soon as the building is up, there is much more interest. But uh, traditionally, we've seen that banks are not willing to start dispersing debt un unless you have their 50, 60, 70 percent pre-sales or pre-lets. Yeah, that, um, that's a comment that I hear all the time um, <laughs> across East Africa. Um, and yeah, I think it's a function of, um, you know, from, from the bank perspective, um, understanding who the developer is, understanding what's the quality of the project that they're looking to put up, um, what's their history in the market, in the region. I think those sorts of things are what give us uh, the comfort to um, really understand the local dynamics and the fact that uh, prelets, again, are, are not something that the local market may provide and allow us to re, uh, re, um, loosen those restrictions, um, if you will. If I could return there to, to a, a question the gentleman up, up here had, had, had posed um, and, and think echoing Louis' comments in terms of the quality and, and the ability to get the prelets, again, from a, from a Kenya and East Africa perspective, 
Um, again, given that history that primarily the, the property market, again, was developed as an outset of these sort of family businesses. Um, what that means today is there's an acute shortage across the sectors, but primarily in your, uh, I'd say your uh, industrial properties, your, your logistics properties, your warehouse properties. And so to the extent as a developer, you know, you're, you're bringing grade A quality of a project, I think then that you would have the ability to not only actually get prelets, but actually you know, dictate uh, to a certain extent the terms and actually get, get long-term leases because again, there is such an acute shortage because historically there wasn't a lot of speculative uh, development of, of those types of properties. So, so if, if I could comment as well on both, both those questions actually. So the, the, I think everything will come back to the asset. So even though we're talking about corporate and funding structures, it's ultimately delivery of assets that people live and work successfully and that, that's going to be what drives things. And uh, when it comes to pre-letting and so on, it's really how the risks play out and where the balance of risk should be. And I don't think funders are yet in the space of saying we're taking all the market risk when there isn't necessarily a proven track record for a particular product or a particular location or whatever it is. But that doesn't mean that that's not going to be possible in the future. So, Louis, you wanted to comment? Yeah, sorry. Uh, sorry. So, just uh, for once in my life, I think I'm actually agreeing with the banks. Uh, I actually think it is very, very healthy for the banks to... I'm going to try and time. record this it moment. It'll be the last time I'll agree. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I think, you know, having, having banks that push pre-let levels um, certainly bring an in integrity to the transactions. Um, having them watching over your back and making sure that you're getting there um, works. From a private equity perspective and having the capital to deploy makes it a little bit easier for us. We only target gearing of around 50%. So the banks that push us to, to get the pre-let levels up require that we put more capital at risk, which we are okay with because that's the nature of what we do. That's how we do, deploy our, our capital and make our returns. So I think from a bank's perspective, pushing, and uh, to Selwyn's point, they are taking senior lender risk. They are not partners, they are not risk takers, they are not equity participants. And I think the minute they become equity participants, they start losing the sense of being a bank. So, you know, if people stick in their boxes and you say private equity is private equity and banks are banks, um, you essentially will get the best of both worlds. You will have product that starts being delivered and people have to be aware and ready to deploy more uh, capital than they would normally. In a South African space, a few years back, you would be a highly leveraged, just, you know, very simple deals would be highly leveraged. You wouldn't need much equity. In the African space, that is very different. You know, we, we put more equity to work because there is a shortage of capital, and that's what makes the, the, the transactions possible to unlock these, these deals. And just one comment on the prelet. Um, you know, we've pushed on the shopping centers that we've opened, the earlier stage shopping centers. Prelets were hard to come by. We took quite big risks. If I look back, um, I think that's where a lot of the grey hair started. But essentially, if you, if you take the positions now, Garden City opened with 95% pre-let. Um, Bayer Mall, which we're opening up in Mozambique at the end of October, is 75% pre-let in the very, very tough circumstances over the last two years since we started. So it is possible to get pre-lets. And I think this is what uh, a lot of people don't appreciate, is that if you work hard and you stick to your knitting, you can actually do it. it you just don't want it to debilitate the process, and you need to have that private equity to unlock that. Um, well, I mean, I, I don't agree with the banks, you know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> somebody, somebody had I, to I take a very, with us. take a very different <laughs> position, you know. Um, but we've also seen instances in the market where you had 100% um, prelet, and by the time you are opening, the conditions have so changed that these tenants cannot even open. Um, when we did Festival Mall in Lagos, you know, by month 15 into construction, we had 100% uh, occupancy prelet. You know, but look at what happened dramatically. By the time we were opening, a lot of the tenants just couldn't open. And I think that we also need to look at the the peculiarities and the idiosyncrasies. I mean, I do a lot of residential development, and if you look across Nigeria, you'll see fundamental differences between a lot of the cities. In Lagos, for example, I could do 100% of plant sales, but in some cities, until you are finishing and you are closing, mm -hmm. nobody's gonna put uh, money down. So we need to also understand those realities, particularly when you want to deal with a lot of um, local retailers, particularly in Nigeria now, um, 
it's, it's, it's difficult for many of them, you know, to really understand this issue of prelates. You know, what has happened, uh, again, is that um, um, you've, we've had to alter the debt equity ratio. Um, when we did Festival Mall, for example, it was 50-50, but now we know that we have to put more capital on ground. You know, we do 60, 70, 30 at least to start with. You know, when a bank sees that you've put in your 60, 70 percent and, it do, and it, they know that they're taking only a 30 percent risk, you know, it, become, it becomes a lot easier for you to sell that particular um, project to, to, to the banks. You know, so it's, a, it's, it's constantly moving. You know, and we have to just take every project, every city, on its own merits, and then take a decision on how you want to do with your funding model. Thank you. Stuart, were you going to comment? Yeah. So, I know my experience on the, on the development side is obviously there's more risk in the development, so banks will charge more for the senior debt. Um, for example, Ghana, we've had offers any, everywhere, anywhere from LIBOR plus four to LIBOR plus eight, eight and a half on the, on the senior debt. Then on, um, so on Louis' side, the private equity, the, the guys normally want a 25% IRR on, on, the, on private equity, um, which is expensive. So where we've actually found the, where we've found the, the kind of medium at the moment and what works for us is in Europe at the moment, people are getting, in Switzerland, they're getting negative 0.75% on their money on call. Um, the rest of Europe, probably around zero. Uh, they can borrow money at about 2%. So what we're doing is we're raising it in the form of MES and we're issuing a PREF and we're just getting going. And once it's finished, we'll refinance it with, with senior debt or sell them. And for us, it's the ticking. Unfortunately, the banks want too many boxes text, uh, ticked. It takes too long, okay? And when you've got a tenant that wants to break into Africa or into a particular city and he wants, to, he wants a dozen shopping centers or a dozen of these centers built within three years, you know, he's dictating the rules, not you can't, and you've got to follow, and you've got to find a way to do it. And unfortunately, sometimes we can't tick all these boxes on, on time to, to cater to the tenant demands, who's saying, yes, we'll sign 10-year leases or 15-year leases, but we want this thing developed by X date. So we stick our necks out, and uh, the, I'm finding that there's a lot more equity or mess around than there is debt. Interesting, and I, I'm assuming that would also drive the way in which you can structure, obviously, because then it's relative pricing between the different sections of the of the capital structure. Yeah, I, I know that there were other there were other questions. Oh, sorry, sorry, Jane. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Chen Wei, Ajani Sanya. I head West Africa for Jones Lang LaSalle. Um, this question is particularly for Louis, um, perhaps because being in Nigeria, I'm quite aware of some of the projects that you've been involved with, and I imagine there's been a lot of lessons learned across the board. Um, so I'm curious to know, given the new market reality, as Hakim has mentioned, the fact that there is a recession economy, um, the markets that used to be pay up front, five years, 10 years up front, um, the expectation of a certain quality or clients willing to pay up to a certain standard, and now those clients are very, very cost conscious. Where do you see your strategy evolving now? Um, are you changing your strategy in terms of the country, in terms of the assets? How do you expect to ma manage this new market reality, which in our opinion is here to stay for at least a couple of years until we recover, and even that recovery is gonna be slow and steady? That's a pretty tough question. Um, I think there's a colleague of mine in the audience, I think Funke is around you somewhere. Um, <laughs> uh, Funke so, is so hiding. If, if Funke was leading the question, I'll sort out afterwards. But uh, um, she's probably better qualified to answer this than me. But I think, you know, somebody once gave me the analogy, analogy of a, a car driving down a road and hitting a pothole. And it's terrible when you're sitting in this pothole. You know, the future looks bleak, recessions are, are tough. And effectively, the, the one thing that you can rest assured is that we will um, come out of it. Um, so it, it's a question of time. You will change the tire and you will get back on the road. So you do have to see through the cycles. And unfortunately, property is a, a somewhat long duration asset. And I think people forget that. They kind of rush in, they build it over two years, they're looking for a quick win, and then they want to, to return their capital. And I think that's, that is a challenge. And I think if you take a, a longer term view, and it all depends on, on your, your view and your horizon, um, the markets will turn and the markets will come back. So 
to the strategy that we are looking at, and I, I do think our markets are somewhat um, influenced by commodities. I think it would be silly for us not to, to look at the, the, the implications of the commodity cycle. I mean, the, the GDP growth of all the countries we operate in um, has taken a big knock over the last few years, last two years, um, due to the, the reduction in, in the commodities. Um, but essentially, I think what you will find is as it does come back, um, the, the cycles will turn and we need to see it through. Um, so do we change the, the policy that we've got on the policy? Do we, do we change our investment strategy um, for the short term? And I think the answer to that is, is no. I think what you will find is that a lot of the investors and developers out there will take uh, a little bit of a pause on Nigeria. They'll wait to see some of the green shoots starting to come out. In markets like uh, Mozambique, for instance, two years ago it was exceptionally bleak. We now starting to see significant signs of improvement. Currencies have started stabilizing. Uh, so they've been appreciating. And that's what we look for. So it's your timing and entry into the market that I think is going to be more important. So will we withdraw out of Nigeria and not invest? The answer is definitely not. Will we be building a 50,000 square meter mall in Nigeria tomorrow? Probably we'll have to wait a little bit longer to see some more green shoots. But there are certainly opportunities that present um, in the markets we, we operate in. And I think if you are investing on the basis of supplying that middle class and hoping it's just going to grow because GDP growth is growing, that's a tough one. I think if you are supplying a market that has no retail center like Maputo, where we are building the only and first retail center of scale, essentially you're filling a gap, and that's different. Um, so one is trying to play the growth story, and the other one is, is filling the gap, and I think that's, that's still the strategy we'll follow. Uh, I, I've got the five-minute signal from, uh, from Freer. Um, James, if, if you could keep it short, and then there's, there's one more question I've, that I've promised. Sure. Um, this is also directed at Louis. Um, what is your uh, view on closed-ended funds, uh, given the cycles in the various markets and the impact on exit values? So I think it's a very good question as well. Um, I think if, if I had it all my way, I would love to have an open-ended fund that basically gave us in a blind pool a whole bunch of capital, call it $500 million to invest. And everyone looks the other way. And everybody looked the other way and smiled when we gave them some sort of dividends <laughs> out in when the children were big. But, um, you know, it is ex extremely difficult to work within the bookends we're given. Um, investors in the markets we operate or that, that deploy the capital or invest the capital in us um, seek certain returns and they need their capital back to be returned. And if it, if it is patient, and I think there are one or two guys that are looking at going open-ended funds and evergreen funds, I think the challenge with that is there is uh, a lack of discipline is, is bound to creep in. Because if you don't have the responsibility to, to return your capital to your investors, you will always be waiting for the, the, the asset to fix itself and for the market to turn. And you'll make investment decisions thinking that, you know, don't worry, we can ride it out. And I think that's a challenge because you do need to prove, you know, your, your worth and you do need to, to be able to deploy capital and you do need to raise capital. And people will only invest in your funds, and this is the experience we've seen, is that they will only invest in your funds if you deliver capital back to them at the returns you promised them. If you don't do that, you don't raise money. Can we just have one more question? Uh, hi, Carl Johan Collette. Um, so before uh, coming to Zambia seven years ago, I worked in the European uh, real estate markets for 10 years. And um, uh, the thing that really stuck out, the big, big difference was the difference in loan amortizations. So in Europe, you amortize 2% a year. Um, in Zambia, 20% a year. And that means that even at a 50% LTV, you're pretty much just working for the bank for the first five years after you've spent all that time delivering your project. What's, uh, no, it's not the banks, no, it's not the banks, no, no. <laughs> so, so do you see any, it hasn't moved for that period. I mean, that, that will eventually have to move, I, I assume, but, but what's, what's happening on that? Um, sure, can't, can't, can't speak to Zambia, but um, have certainly seen that, that evolution in Kenya in terms of the evolution of, of amortization structures and being willing to go to go a lot longer. So, you know, a number of years, you know, uh, of doing 10 years um, in Kenya was quite a challenge. Uh, now it's, it's the norm. Now we're trying to figure out, you know, how to go, how to go longer than that. Um, on a, sorry? Right, and, and take, take some view of refinancing risk. Um, but that's on the dollars. I think 
um, on, on shillings, on your local currency, we'd always been comfortable um, going out to 10 years or more, I think. From a regulatory perspective, you know, we have the interest rate capping law uh, in, in Kenya introduced last year that um, overnight has, has shifted our, our cost of capital dynamics. Um, and, and the primary sort of result of that is tenor. Um, our ability to offer local currency tenor beyond seven years, literally overnight, that went from being profitable to unprofitable because our margins have just been compressed so much. But again, where the, the asset makes sense, that's where we could take a view of, all right, you have a large residual at the end of seven years, for example, to still give the client the long tenor that they're looking for, but with a contractual tenor that's a little bit more, uh, you know, fits our returns hurdles, for example. So I think uh, we've been asked to, to wind things up. I, I know we could have had a considerably longer conversation than the one that we've had. And thanks to uh, well, all of you and, and particularly to our panelists. So I think we'll be hanging around for the next uh, day and a bit and can be approached with uh, specific questions. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you.